Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine beginning at the age of four. Today is our monthly headache news episode, and I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me again. This is always uh, a, a great time. <laughs> Dr. Smith, as many of you know, is a regular on our show because he has extensive experience in migraine and headache clinical trials as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. Dr. Smith is also a board member of the National Headache Foundation. He has so much knowledge. I always love to hear what he has to say. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the new and interesting medical studies and information that were published in the last month in the area of headache and migraine and see what he can tell us about it. So the first new news that we're going to talk about today is a study that was just released looking at whether or not it is safe to combine a couple of our new medications that are focused on the CGRP molecule. Uh, there, we do this because uh, we sometimes wonder if we're taking a preventive medicine and then we still get a migraine, can we go ahead and take a medicine that will help us stop the migraine in process on top of that? Is that safe? And so they did a study comparing a toge pant and ubroge pant, putting them together. Is it safe for us to take that together? Now, this is Culipta and Ubrelvi, for those of you that are used to those names. Dr. Smith, what did this study find? So this was a, a phase one study that is basically uh, what we call a pharmacokinetic study. They, they drew blood samples of the levels of the drugs that were involved to see mm -hmm. if there was an influence in either direction. So if you take Culipta daily as a preventive and then you have a breakthrough migraine and take Ubrelvi on top of that, um, is that safe to do? And the answer is yes. Uh, there was uh, no difference in the Culipta um, drug levels if you combine Ubrelvi, but there was a slight 20% uh, increase uh, in the uh, Ubrelvi um, uh, blood levels uh, as compared to um, placebo. So if it, it, okay. it's, it was clearly a drug interaction effect. Uh, and as it turns out, in the pharmacokinetic world, that 20% change is not very dramatic it's uh, and there was no clinical uh, correlate so in a nutshell it means that there's no uh, pharmacokinetic or safety reason why pe people can't combine the two okay and this study didn't go into whether or not it was effective to take your probably when you're already taking uh culipta correct it just was looking to see if that was safe right yeah, it answers the question can you take the the two not not should you so uh okay. it's uh but and it and it's okay. So it would be just up to the individual, you know, uh, person to decide whether it was helpful or not. Great. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on. We always like to, whenever there's a press release about a new medication that is coming out or that is even in just phase one, someone's looking at it. We always like to let everyone know there's been a press release that came out about something that they're calling pull matrix. Uh, what, what is this, Dr. Smith? I do believe it could be somewhat similar to something we already have. We have a DHE nasal spray called Trudessa already, and I believe this is similar, but maybe we inhale it through our lungs. That would be it. So, yeah. uh, yes, the, uh, we have, you know, multiple other versions of DHE that are available. Of course, we know the IV or IM shots mm -hmm. that you can get from your doctor's office, or some people can be, uh, you know, use an intramuscular shot at home, self-administered if they learn how to do it. And mm -hmm. then the nasal spray versions, Migranol has been around for a long time and now Tradesa in the last year or two. Uh, and, this is uh, different because it's the same DHE molecule that we know works for migraine, but uh, they put this into a pulmonary inhaler, uh, much like uh, someone would use for an asthma inhaler or, or right. the like. And this, uh, we know that the vascular um, surface area in the um, in the lungs is very dynamic and can absorb medications very briskly and. And uh, so this this makes sense to look at this as a way to deliver a medication rapidly. So anything that happens, you know, acutely like that, that you want to get rapid relief from and migraine would be one of those 
you know, type of conditions. We know mm -hmm. that very well. And uh, this would give us our, our, our patients an option to to get this into their bloodstream much more quickly. And uh, the hope is that that will equate to a therapeutic uh, response. Uh, this It's important, I think, to note that this is a phase one study from this uh, company. It's what they're reporting out on in their press release. So they've got a long way to go before they can can get to, you know, uh, giving us some effectiveness data. So this looked at blood concentrations, and it shows that if you administer this intra uh, in, through a pulmonary route, that it rivals the doses that uh, the drug levels that people can get in an IV. So okay. uh, if speed is important, this should be helpful. Great. Okay, and I think they also said something about... Uh, Nausea and vomiting, which I think is a side effect people often get if they get DHG, IV. Uh, how did that turn out so far for this early preliminary trial of this medication? Well, so far, and it's a small study, but uh, this it looks favorable uh, okay. when compared to IV. And we know that IV, uh, many of our patients with, when we give IVs in the clinics, you know, most of the time we will, you know, pre-dose with uh, an anti-nausea medicine. That's how prevalent it is for IVs. So for this one to not show a, a trend, a troubling trend, that's encouraging too. So something about the pulmonary administration um, make it gives us a chance to get high uh, concentrations in the blood in a short period of time without causing a lot of side effects. Okay. So next, we learned something new and interesting about cluster headache this month, which is exciting because we don't as often get to talk about cluster headache as we do migraine. Um, there just isn't as much research being done in the area and it is so important. So um, so please really quick, for anyone who doesn't know in the audience, can you quickly tell us why cluster is so significant and important? Yes, uh, you know, cluster headache is, we always say that, you know, moment for moment, it's probably the worst uh, head pain of any of the primary headache disorders. Uh, it, it's just so excruciating and, and horrible um, that uh, it's it makes it really hard to study, actually. I think we've talked about that on this podcast before because it's we don't see a lot of new study data coming out on cluster headache patients. And um, uh, sometimes it's just because the study designs are so difficult. You have to mm -hmm. combine your need for scientific data uh, with the need to, you know, not be unethical <laughs> with Stop our our pain. study volunteers. You know, you right. can't just let them suffer. You have to have right. to give them an out. And sometimes when you do that, it, it messes up the study. So anyway, um, uh, we we do we regard cluster differently. Uh, migraine is bad. I'm not saying it's not. The migraine attacks are much longer and incapacitating. The cluster attacks are brief, but they are inc incredibly severe when people have them. Okay. So um, historically, we tend to discuss the fact that cluster is more common in males than females. That's one of the bits of data we know. So what is the surprising new, some of the surprising new things that this study found? Yeah, so this was, uh, this is a study that was done by some Scandinavian researchers in, in Sweden. And uh, they have a long track record of a lot of robust uh, epidemiologic uh, studies in this area. So these are experienced investigators that have worked in this space before, especially in migraine. And what they did is they looked at a very large cohort of patients um, that had a uh, verified uh, cluster headache diagnosis. And uh, they uh, examined these and uh, looked at subpopulations of them. And we always mm -hmm. uh, refer to uh, male, the, there's a male preponderance in cluster headache, and we know that's mm -hmm. true. And they they showed this as well. So, two thirds of the of this uh, population of uh, patients that they uh, evaluated were male, and one third were female. But the interesting thing that they found was when they looked at the uh, at the subpopulations of episodic versus chronic cluster. And the chronic cluster patients are the ones that go either without ever having a remission or only having a less than 90-day remission uh, per year. And uh, these people have incredibly poor quality of life. I mean, they suffer uh, just incredible amounts of incapacitation, disability, and just searing pain. And when they looked at that particular subpopulation, as it turns out, uh, the uh, females outnumbered the males two to one. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So while the overall population of uh, male to female preponderance is strongly towards the male side, uh, when you look at that more severe cohort of patients that suffer the most uh, cluster headache disability, they tend to be more female uh, than male by a significant amount and statistically significant too, uh, I might add. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think they also said that some of those uh, autonomic features that come with cluster headache, like I think watering eye and a couple other things, are they more commonly seen in the female group? Yeah, in, the, in the female group, there were some other differences. Uh, and as you point out, that autonomic uh, uh, symptomatology of the bloodshot, watery eye with a drooping eyelid, that was much more common in females than in males. Um, the females had that restlessness symptom that we talk about, the uh, cluster patients get up in pace. You know, we say migraine patients uh, get in a fetal position and in a dark place and don't want to move. And our cluster patients want to get up in pace and and uh, and they get very agitated and restless. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, agitated uh, behaviors that uh, uh, come in the middle of that attack. And that tends to be more so in the females uh, in, than males in this chronic uh, cluster uh, population. Um, and they the, also the females reported uh, more longer bouts of attacks than the, mm -hmm. than the males. And uh, they also had uh, were more likely to be taking prophylactic agents, preventive agents, uh, such as calcium channel blockers and the like. And, uh, you know, so there were some other, then uh, they were more likely to have that diurnal um, uh, pattern to the, to their, mig their cluster attacks and more of the nocturnal attacks that come right. on every couple of hours throughout the night. Uh, and that seemed to be uh, another feature. So there's clearly, I guess, the point we're making is there's uh, a sort of a phenotypic difference that's based on uh, uh, biological uh, gender, you know, fr from the uh, difference between uh, females to males in this uh, in this population of uh, chronic cluster uh, headache patients. So okay. it's interesting. So uh, next. There was a press release this month about a new resource that's free of charge to all of us. Uh, it's great for both employees and employers regarding migraine. So the National Headache Foundation announced that they've made one of their resources available to all of us free of charge. Um, and it's called Work Migraine. And I have seen this, it's, it's great. It has modules to help employers understand how to best help employees with migraine and also help employees understand how best to communicate and um, do best for themselves at work when they have migraine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this, uh, uh, this resource, what it does, where we can find it, et cetera? Sure. It's, it's a really great educational resource that has been developed by the National Headache Foundation. It was basically put together by some uh, uh, headache experts and with the with the main focus of trying to um, bring some positive influence into the workplace to try to improve uh, migraine patients' ability to uh, work effectively and uh, to try to reduce absenteeism and presenteeism, you know, that we talk about presenteeism all the time, and then also to try to reduce uh, migraine stigma. And we know that, you know, so many of our migraine patients, they suffer through work uh, situations and they don't dare say anything about it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, try to work at their desks or wherever they work and try to um, just uh, fake it until they make it, so to speak. And um, we feel like a more open recognition of the fact that uh, somewhere between 12 and 20 percent of the work uh, force, depending on you know age ranges and genders of people that uh, work uh, in a given uh, capacity, uh, may have or may have migraine and and those and mm -hmm. there's over 150,000 uh, people a day in the U.S. that are in bed with migraine and then many times that over that didn't stay in bed got up and went to work but they're they're uh, trying to just struggle through the day and try right. not to uh, contribute to that uh, stigma issue that uh, that so many of us have to deal with and so the we feel like the the best counter to that is just to have better education, better understanding of the issues and uh, what it's like to be a, a, a migraine patient. 
And mm -hmm. so there are modules that address the migraine patient experience. What can you do for yourself? Uh, how can you advocate for yourself? Uh, what are the things that you should expect and, and do in the workplace yourself? And then there are modules for the employer and for like the uh, human resources and wellness types that uh, work in these uh, companies. So the thinking is that, you know, the best thing to do is, you know, let's let's get the most out of, you know, if you're an employer, you want the most out of your coworkers. You want them to be healthy and able to do their jobs. That's why wellness programs are so popular nowadays. Um, and what we'd like to see is an uptick in the number of these wellness programs that actually address migraine, because in some of our experiences and talking to employers, uh, so many of the wellness uh, cent centers with uh, these uh, uh, companies, large and small, may take on things like mental health or they may, you know, spend a lot of time dealing with pregnancy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, many of them don't really uh, um, avail themselves of uh, the opportunity to to have some impact in migraine. And we know that that this can be very impactful in the workplace uh, to help improve uh, patients' uh, quality of life and their and their work production. We all of our studies we do nowadays on on medications and programs measure work productivity. And there's no question that we can impact that positively, uh, but we need to let these folks know, you know, how that works and let patients know what they can expect from it. And so that's what the Work Migraine Program does. And now the foundation has made it available to people for free and they can go to headaches.org slash work migraine and okay. they can look at it for themselves. And you, yeah, I hope you'll feel free to do it and uh, tell your friends and neighbors and uh, let's uh, start making some impact on this. I'm, I'm super pumped that the foundation is uh, making this available uh, for people because that's what we're here for is to try to uh, make that a, a reality for people. All right, that's great. Uh, I hope everyone goes there, even someone like me for years. I, I'm very vocal about migraine now, but for years I hit it at work. So I think it's really important that everyone goes and learns about how to talk about it and what they can do to get help, et cetera. So um, we have two more uh, news bits to cover. Uh, we have previously covered uh, on the podcast, white matter lesions on MRI in the setting of migraine. So many people have, um, seen that they have white metal lesions on MRI, that it was one of our most popular podcasts, actually. Um, so this is a new MRI study that has come out, and it found something just a little different. Uh, can you tell us what new MRI uh, data came out related to migraine this month? Sure. Um, this uh, the interesting thing. So the the researchers are are using. Um, it seems like every year these uh, MRI machines, the magnets, keep getting more powerful and and uh, and more, um, you know, just dramatically capable of of mm -hmm. uh, demonstrating these ultra structural changes that just even a few years ago we couldn't even see. With mm -hmm. it, with even with our best Im imaging, and so they get these big multi Tesla, seven Tesla magnets, magnets, and and um, uh, they can see a lot more detail. And what these researchers have done is they looked at the difference. They studied people with chronic migraine, episodic migraine, and non migraine uh, patients' brains, looking at these MRIs, looking for these ultra structural differences. And what they saw is that uh, there are some brain changes that occur. In patients with uh, with migraine, that that non migraine uh, brains don't demonstrate, and and specifically, there's these little spaces around blood vessels called perivascular spaces, and uh, they are probably involved, or well, we know they're involved in helping uh, clear fluids and and uh, metabolic byproducts out of the brain. It's sort of the brain's equivalent of the lymphatic system. And those of you that know the anatomy and, and physiology of the human body, the lymphatic system drains these, the lymph and the, the waste tissue, uh, tissue waste and serum and stuff from the, from the body and back to the central circulation where it can go through the liver and other areas and get reprocessed and, and, the, and the kidneys and, and kind of clear the serum out and, and reutilize proteins and those kinds right. of things. And that's the equivalent. They don't have lymphatic channels in the brain, but apparently these glial cells that are sort of the scavenger cells in the brain, some of them are, and they clear out uh, this metabolic byproducts and uh, and uh, enable the, the brain to continue to function. Otherwise, it would get just 
clogged up and jammed up with uh, with these uh, meta- byproducts of metabolism. And so you have to clear right. them out for the brain to be healthy. Well, we know that for our migraine patients, some of those uh, centers in the brain are really uh, hyperactive and there's a lot of oxidative stress in, in these areas where the these pathways are, are are really wound up and over overreactive, transmitting all those pain signals and promoting inflammation and all the things that just kill us when we have a migraine attack. Right. And so those systems, uh, theoretically at least, the the all of that activity, you got to clear all that stuff out, and it may make these perivascular spaces bigger and more noticeable. And it could be that. These are what explains the, these hyperintense white matter lesions that we see on the MRI. There was an anatomical correlation with these perivascular spaces and those white matter lesions uh, when they looked at those. So it's a fascinating thing. We've never really, we've only had sort of theoretical guesswork on what's going on. And while this study doesn't explain it exactly and, and fully, it does give us uh, uh, a clear uh, difference that we can focus on more. And uh, it fits with some of the theories about what's going on and, and why this might happen. And so it's, uh, it's, it's an encouraging uh, outcome. And it's just, uh, you know, shows what we can do with, you know, better technology and, you know, better imaging uh, and, and uh, finding out more about these ultrastructural changes that we were never able to see before. I find that very fascinating. Uh, just to learn, we're going to learn more and more as this progresses about what's really going on in our brains that's either causing a migraine or what's going on during migraine. And I just find that study very fascinating. I hope everyone else does too. Um, I left this one for last because I think a lot of people will find it surprising. This last study has to do with triggers and migraine. Uh, A study came out where uh, they followed people, uh, they followed everything they did essentially in their triggers and what they thought their triggers were. And when they got migraine, what 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 did they find? Well, in a nutshell, they uh, kind of said that uh, this uh, whole uh, process of trying to identify uh, trigger events that cause migraine and, and avoid them is maybe overblown. Mm-hmm. Um, and specifically in the study, that uh, what they did is they took a, a large co- cohort of patients and um, uh, looked at their migraine attacks and all the other things that were happening to them in their lives. And they came up with some statistical correlates for uh, things that appeared to be a trigger or risk factor events uh, for migraine. And then they looked at what the patients actually reported mm-hmm. as uh, as uh, their tr- triggers or risk factors. And uh, the, there was only an association between those two comparisons about 30% of the time, not even 30% for a lot of them. So uh, it sort of calls into question, you know, some of the presumptions that we make about uh, risk factors and triggers and avoiding triggers. And I think maybe, you know, um, uh, to me, the call to action would be, you know, let's let's focus on, you know, getting adequate and better medications and and better, you know, self-nurturing activities and less of the avoidance kind of things. If it, if it's clearly apparent that an individual trigger is important to you, then by all means, you know, we're not saying you should avoid, you shouldn't avoid right. that. That would be right. silly. But for people out there that are on this quest to try to find their quote unquote trigger events and, and try to wipe that out of their system, um, you know, this study would say that, you know, while it might be smart to think about it, uh, you know, it's probably not going to result in a, a drastic and major change in, in outcomes, knowing what they are and, and avoiding them. So uh, there are some flaws in the way this is done. And, and uh, you know, they, and they one of the things that they did is they looked at the these uh, trigger factors in a in a univariate um, fashion, meaning they just looked at them individually. Right. And we know that triggers don't behave that way. You know, your risk factors are, we used to say they're stackable, you know, so when you've got a, three or four of them, you know, the, the, the one you had last, right before the headache started was the one that was your identifiable trigger, but it was mm-hmm. probably a multifactorial thing. And a study mm-hmm. like this can't really take that into account. This would take a much, much bigger study to, to look at those. So, um, so I think there's some value in the study. Uh, I, I think uh, it can be instructional to a lot of people. I don't think it says that triggers aren't important, but they're not the only thing, you know. And so for right. people who are just really, really 
uh, spending the, a lot of their energy and effort trying to avoid or identify, you know, trigger uh, events. Um, that's that's only part of the equation, I guess, was what we would say. Right. I, I like to think of it as if you're so focused on triggers that it's either giving you anxiety, decreasing yeah. your enjoyment of life, or you feel like you did something wrong every time you get a migraine, then maybe you're a little over overly focused on the on the trigger idea. It's not your fault every time you get a migraine. So that's that's how I like to look at it personally. We, but. we don't need to blame ourselves more right. for anything. <laughs> so right. <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Smith, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close today? I think we uh, we covered it uh, covered it pretty well. Some interesting articles, okay. and uh, there's always more, you know. But uh, right. we'll try to try to bring the most interesting and uh, and kind of new, novel kinds of things is what we'd like to focus on. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Smith. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And please join us again next week for Headwise, the weekly videocast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. See you soon.